Hello, fifth graders. This is the reading of Restoration Case Studies. During this video, I encourage you to follow along as I read aloud and to pause the video whenever you need to stop. We are going to be reading three case studies in this video. The first case study is for Chapter 2, Lesson 5, Yellowstone National Park. The other two case studies we will be reading are for Chapter 3, Lesson 5, and those are Cape Cod Salt Marshes and the Alberta Forest and Wetlands. Let's go ahead and get started. Okay, the first case study we are going to look at is Yellowstone National Park. Remember, this is for Lesson 5 for Chapter 2. The Ecosystem. Yellowstone is a national park that is mostly in the state of Wyoming. It's home to more than half of the world's geysers, or natural hot springs that sometimes shoot boiling water and steam into the air. You may have heard of Yellowstone's most famous geyser, Old Faithful. The park sits on a powerful volcano, sometimes called a supervolcano. The volcano has not erupted in thousands of years. The wildlife within Yellowstone National Park is truly amazing. Grizzly bears and black bears live there. Cougars, wolverines, and bobcats roam through the park. Toads, frogs, snakes, more than 150 species of birds, many native fish, and more than 65 kinds of mammals call Yellowstone home. The park is also home to aspen trees, whose leaves turn a beautiful yellow during the fall. As you can see on the map below of North America, the orange dot represents where Yellowstone National Park is located. The image to the right is a herd of bison that walks through Yellowstone National Park. These pages show Yellowstone's food web. I can see a lot of plants, aspen trees, grass, blackberries, um, herbivores. I can see consumers, omnivores, carnivores. Remember, as you look at food webs, the arrows point to where the energy is going. So let's go ahead and follow one of the food chains. So let's start with aspen tree. If we follow the arrows, the energy from the aspen tree goes to the rabbit. Then the energy from the rabbit goes to the bobcat. And then the energy from the bobcat goes to the cougar. Once the cougar dies, then the energy goes either to earthworms or dead matter. Let's continue. The problem. In the 1980s, scientists noticed that the aspen trees in Yellowstone were dying off. In fact, no new aspen trees had grown in the park since 1930. The only aspen trees remaining in the park started growing before 1930. Something changed in Yellowstone around the time that new aspen trees stopped growing. When Yellowstone was first established as a national park, wolves ranged far and wide. But people thought the wolves were dangerous because they occasionally killed some of the cattle that grazed nearby. For many years, the government paid people to kill the wolves. The last wolf pack in Yellowstone was killed in 1926. Scientists realized there was a connection between the aspen trees and the wolves that used to live in the park. After the wolves were killed off, the animals that the wolves used to eat, such as elk, increased in population. The elk were eating the leaves off the young aspen trees and stepping on them. When the elk population increased, the aspen trees were killed before they had a chance to grow to their full size. So if we look at the image below, the aspen trees have their golden fall leaves. And the picture next to it is after the wolves were killed, the elk population grew. Let's look at the next page. Restoration plan and outcome. Scientists came up with a solution to help new aspen trees grow, bringing wolves back to Yellowstone National Park. In 1995, some scientists brought young wolves from Canada into the park. Since then, the wolves has raised pups and formed new packs. Today, more than 100 wolves live in the park. As scientists predicted, wolves have been scaring elk away from aspen groves and keeping the population under control. New aspen trees are thriving and growing taller. The trees have given birds and beavers more food and places to hide. The beaver population has been rising. Still, some people think that bringing back the wolves was a mistake. A few wolves have left the park and killed cattle on nearby ranches, and some people are worried that the elk population will drop too low because of the wolves. It will take many years to find out all of the ways the Yellowstone ecosystem has changed because humans brought the wolves back. 
Do you think it was a good idea to bring the wolves back to Yellowstone? What are some other ways to help keep the animal populations in balance? The image, this wolf has killed an elk in a river. So remember, this is the case study for chapter two, lesson five. So go ahead and go back to your activity packet and answer those questions. Now we are going to look at the case studies that go with less, chapter three, lesson five, Cape Cod salt marshes and Alberta forests and wetlands. So right now we're gonna start with Cape Cod salt marshes. The ecosystem. Cape Cod, which sticks out like an arm from the state of Massachusetts, is home to many salt marshes. Marshes are a kind of wetland, which is a place where the ground is wet or all or most of the time. Salt marshes are flooded with salty ocean water whenever the tide is high. Salt marshes clean populate pollution from the water and they protect coastal areas from getting flooded or washed away. They keep Cape Cod from disappearing into the Atlantic Ocean. Salt marshes are a very important ecosystem. So you can see on the map of North America, the orange dot represents where the salt marshes are located. Plants like sedges, rushes, and grasses grow along the edges of the marshes. Fish and shrimp live in the marsh water. Different kinds of crabs crawl along the shoreline. Together, the animals and plants make up a food web. Marsh crabs feed on the grass. Blue crabs and striped bass feed on the marsh crabs. Humans and birds eat the striped bass. One of the grasses in the salt marsh is called cord grass. Cord grass can grow taller than a basketball player. Cord grass helps keep the shoreline in place and filters out things that pollute the ecosystem. And the image shows that that is a healthy salt marsh. Okay, this is a Cape Cod salt marsh food web similar to the Yellowstone National Park food web. It starts with a plant like algae and then it gets consumed by a mama chalk, and then it that is consumed by a raccoon. Once the raccoon dies, then it is decomposed by dead matter or marine bacteria. The problem. Scientists noticed that cord grass in the salt marshes on Cape Cod was dying off. This left the soil bare and allowed it to be washed away by rain and waves. To find out why the cord grass was dying, scientists did an experiment. They compared the marshes with dying cord grass to the marshes where cord grass was healthy. They found something surprising. The dying marshes were near areas where people fish. What does fishing have to do with dying cord grass? Many of the fish in the marsh ecosystem eat marsh crabs and marsh crabs eat cord grass. So when people caught these fish, it helped the marsh crabs thrive. More marsh crabs meant more cord grass was getting eaten. To test their idea that marsh crabs were the cause of the disappearing cord grass, scientists went to healthy marshes and put, the, put in mesh cages that fish couldn't enter. These cages protected the marsh crabs from their predators but allowed the marsh crabs to eat the cord grass. The cord grass in those cages quickly disappeared because the marsh crabs in the cages ate all of it. Fishing may not be the only reason why cord grass is dying, but most scientists agree it is an important cause. The image below shows that the cord grass is dying off in this salt marsh. Restoration plan and outcome. Scientists are just beginning to test how to help the cord grass grow back. They noticed that a type of muscle was also dying off and they have tried adding more of those muscles back to the ecosystem. Muscles put nutrients in the soil and help cord grass grow larger. Another animal is helping the cord grass too, something scientists didn't plan. The European green crab is native to Europe, but due to, in part, to human activities, it has spread to ecosystems all around the world. In the salt marshes of Cape Cod, European green crabs may be helping the cord grass recover by eating purple marsh crabs. However, invasive species like the European green crab often cause a lot of damage to ecosystems, and their effects can be unpredictable because it seems like these invasive crabs may actually be helping the salt marshes. So far, the restoration project doesn't include trying to get rid of the crabs. Scientists are still observing to see if the European green crab will cause new problems in Cape Cod salt marshes. Can you think of what else scientists might do to restore the marshes? 
What might happen if scientists tried to increase the population to other marsh crab predators, like the striped bass? The image below shows that these mussels provide, provide nutrients that help cord grass grow. Okay. Let's look at our next case study for chapter three, lesson five, Alberta forest and wetlands. Ecosystem. Vast forests stretch across Alberta, Canada. In these forests live caribou, moose, songbirds, wolves, and bears. Overlapping with the forest are hundreds of square miles of wetlands, swamps, bogs, and marshes. In one section of the Alberta wetlands are the Athabasca oil sands. Oil sand is a mixture of petroleum, sand, and water. Petroleum is valuable to the Canadian economy because it's used to make fuel. You can see on the map of North America below, the orange dot represents where you can find the Alberta forest and wetlands. The image to the right is a healthy forest. These pages show an Alberta forest and wetlands food web. Remember, the arrows point to the direction that the energy is going. So if we follow one of the paths, if we follow grass, the energy goes to the caribou, and then the energy goes to the grizzly bear from the caribou. Once the grizzly bear dies, fungus and dead matter decompose the grizzly bear. Also keep in mind that decomposers can decompose anything that dies within the ecosystem. The problem. In the 1960s, mining companies started mining at the Athabasca oil sands for oil. The number of mines has steadily increased, covering more and more of the oil sands. Today, mining companies take almost a million barrels of oil from the oil sands every day. Mining damages the wetlands. To build mines, mining companies cut down the trees. They remove the sand and huge trucks. They dig mines that go deep into the earth. The mining leaves behind a mix of salt, silt, and clay that has few nutrients and many toxins. Because of the toxins, it is hard for plants and animals to live there. The mining also kills off decomposers. The image below, this is a mining operation that has killed many organisms, leaving behind toxic soil. Restoration plan and outcome. Recently, scientists started thinking about how to restore these lands. Scientists are planting trees and trying to make it easier for them to grow. They put a special kind of fungus on new trees to help them grow. Fungi are decomposers that help break down dead things, but certain kinds of fungi also provide nutrients for trees. The fungi attach to the tree's roots, then branch out into the soil and absorb more nutrients for the tree. These fungi also seem to protect the trees from toxins. Scientists hope that by putting fungi on the roots of young trees, they can help the trees grow in the oil sands. It's too soon to say whether these special seedlings will grow in the oil sands, Scientists at the companies that are mining the oil sands believe plants will grow back, but other scientists do not think that this restoration plan will work. They think that the oil sands will never have all the organisms that they used to have. Either way, there is a lot of work to be done. Planting trees with special fungi on their roots may be a step in the right direction. How else do you think scientists can help the plants thrive? What can be done to stop the land from getting more damaged? The photos below. This is a photo of fungus that helps trees get nutrients and it was taken through a microscope. And this image says scientists put fungus on the roots of the seedling before the planting. The fungus looks like a white powder in the picture. So remember the two case studies we just read, the Alberta forests and wetlands and Cape Cod salt marshes are for chapter three, lesson five. So you can go ahead and go answer those questions now. This concludes our reading of restoration case studies.